Man, it's been a while since I've done one of these. Welcome back to Weird Old Kid Shows and Cartoons, the series where I do exactly what the title says, and then you guys all go, Whoa, I remember that! I always do look forward to the violent nostalgia these videos give me. That and the repressed memories they uncover. I got another 10 to look at today. Some that I grew up with, and some that I thought just looked fucking weird. Hmm, let's see. I think we should start off with... Aw oh, yeah, it's Pingu time! Pingu is a claymation show about an asshole penguin terrorizing his family and other residents of the South Pole. <laughs> No one in the show speaks a word of comprehensible dialogue. Instead, they communicate using what I can only describe to you as penguin noises. I'm very grateful this is the case, though, because to me, it makes it one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> the fucking slapping noises they make when they waddle absolutely kills me. Yes, I am very mature. <laughs> Of course you can't talk about Pingu without mentioning some of the accidental nightmare fuel. The times when the animators leaned a little too hard into the trippy visuals. Most infamous of all, of course, being the Dreams episode, where Pingu falls asleep and is given a glimpse into the hell that awaits him in the afterlife. <laughs> Also, there was a reboot made in 2017 called Pingu in the City, which was co-produced in Japan, which technically means that Pingu is an anime, and its presence on my anime list never fails to make me laugh. <laughs> Pingu's an anime. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Maker is a British TV series about the titular Mr. Maker making stuff. Every episode followed more or less the exact same formula, with numerous segments of arts and craft with varying degrees of quality, some kids showing up and doing some random shit, and of course the awakening of the ancient deities known as the Shapes. Oh golly, the children got out again. I think it was always more about watching him work his magic rather than serving as a tutorial to make things on your own. <laughs> because it's not like the episodes gave you enough time to gather the 15 million things required to craft along with him. As well as a plastic wipe slid, we'll need some things from the doodle drawers. Come on. Oh, shit. Some paper, card, and scissors. Yeah, hold on. Some paint and some paint brushes. Fucking wait! It's about as helpful as those cooking shows who insist that this one particular meal only takes 10 minutes to cook, but then leave out the half an hour of preparation and gathering of the ingredients. Easily the highlight of each episode were the shapes though, who actually I'm not really sure what they are. Who's that snoring? Oh, it's the shapes. Let's wake them up. Why? <laughs> this is all of course accompanied by quite possibly the greatest musical number in human history. That's my dream job right there. I am ashamed to admit that Mr. Maker is one of the few shows that I enjoyed watching whenever it was on in spite of the target audience being like, toddlers. There was just something engaging about the way it's presented that made it easy to get into, which I suppose was the entire point. What that says about me, I'm really not sure. And let it be known that I still quote this series on a daily basis when it comes to his sagely advice on scissors. But be careful because scissors are sharp. Welcome to Grizzly Tales for Gruesome Kids. Ah yes, Grizzly Tales for Gruesome Kids. The series that only very unique children could get enjoyment out of. This is one of the strangest shows I think I ever had the misfortune of stumbling across as a kid. And yet I would always watch it out of what I assume was morbid curiosity. It's an anthology series based off of an old line of books, where every episode would tell a tale of a rebellious child being condemned to a torturous punishment for the rest of eternity. I think there's supposed to be a moral in there somewhere, but... The episodes always began with this incredibly promising and well-animated segment of some random child entering a cinema during 2020, before a very gruff narrator would introduce us to this episode's unwilling subject. And if you think that's impressive, wait till you see the animation of the actual show. Who wants to be first? Peregrine with your short back and sides? Or Tanya? I have you down for the full chop. It's good to see that the animators of the CDI Zelda games are still receiving work. 
Spaghetti! I'm also like 95% sure it's the same guy doing the voices for every single character. Your food won't go away just because you've closed your eyes. Then I shall make it go away! Obviously they blew all their budget on the lifelike animation. The children in the episodes always receive suitable punishments for their bad behavior though. Like this kid who continually refuses to eat his dinner getting turned into it. Meal times without Timothy were never the same again. The best part is his parents are ecstatic about it. Tonight, it's lasagna! <laughs> or this barber who cuts the tongues off of children who swear a lot. Or this girl who was eaten to death by piranhas until nothing but her skeleton remains. Yes, I know. What the fuck? I also think this series is what instilled my subconscious fear of British people. Slugs! And I am still hesitant to eat popcorn every single time because of this show, so thank you, Grizzly Tales. I'm pretty sure we should, like, investigate everyone that worked on this show. This is definitely someone's fetish, and I hate that. So there was this show that aired every now and then on Australian television called Horace in Slow Motion, a series so obscure it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. The premise of every episode is that a tubby pig wearing nothing but his underwear, who has nipples for some reason, continually finds a way to fall to the ground in a rather spectacular fashion, with the appeal of the show being its uncomfortably detailed jiggle physics displayed during his slow descent to the ground. <laughs> Oh, and he farts a lot, because, I mean, of course he does. Each episode was less than a minute long, so believe me when I say I assure you the existence of the show was solely to show off his floppy man titties. I can feel nothing but endless pity for the animators who had to painstakingly craft the physics of each individual fat roll in every single episode. Thanks, Australia. I hate it. Okay, I, I didn't even know how to describe this one. Super Opera is a series of very odd short segments that I've excluded from the previous two videos in this series simply because it's so hard to talk about. It's a rather unconventional French stop motion series that aired a lot on Australian TV, in which a bunch of random fruits and vegetables would disassemble themselves to become animals. I can say from an adult perspective that this series is super impressive in how they were able to make something like this. Stop motion's hard enough on its own, so why anyone would want to do it with circular objects that don't stay in place is beyond me. But I think what made this one so bizarre were the music choices. You hear a lot from the people who remember this series saying they were absolutely terrified of it. Which, honestly, I can totally understand. The setting of the pitch black void and hypnotizing alien music certainly wouldn't be easy on a small child's mind. Plus, since they were only about two minutes each in length, they never appeared in the TV guide. Meaning soup opera could have appeared without warning at any given moment. <laughs> I honestly don't have a lot to say about the What Whats, except that my brother used to adore this show, and so I was forced to sit through many 10 minute increments of these two weird ass looking aliens communicating exclusively in the exact same word over and over. The general premise of this show was that these two were aliens from some hopefully far away planet, who have come down to Earth to study our wildlife, and every episode is filled with moments of them dicking around in their spaceship before learning all about a new animal since their ship was always conveniently right next to a zoo. Without anyone noticing. Ooh. Our two leads are the very brilliantly named Spotty Watt and his sister Dottie Watt. And yes, I do have to commend the editors for having the goal to make a show so heavily reliant on comic sense. To assist us in understanding what the actual hell they're saying, we have a narrator who so very eagerly informs us of the events of each episode. Oh, what, what, what? Oh, yes. Very good. I feel it's also worth mentioning that Wikipedia tells me that the same company that did the visual effects for the What Watts also worked on the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, which, you know, are pretty much equal in scope. The What Watts also recently birthed a spin-off called Cadets, which really does raise some questions about the life cycle of the what what species. Gotta say though, I don't envy the voice actors here. What do you want? Oh, what do you want? 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 Boobies like me. Boobies like you. And now, introducing an idea which definitely got some intern promoted is Ubi, a show where every single character is a hand with eyes on it. It's not too different from your typical kid show with puppets, only that I somehow find it even funnier to imagine what's going on beneath the camera. And it's upon watching this that I realize why they usually use puppets to cover up their hand. Because this is terrifying. And to add to the terror is the fact that they all speak like cavemen. Yay! Lunch! 
Tomato sauce? Well, sometimes they do. Other times, I don't know what the fuck they're saying. Uma. Uma. Ubi Keiko Uma. Every episode has them getting up to various wacky activities, like taking a shit. <laughs> Wait, how do they even- It is amazing how much emotion they're able to convey with just a hand, though. Bathroom. Dirty. Oh. They also have segments later on where they interrogate kids about the topic of the episode. And water goes. I am surprised at how calm these children are speaking to a disembodied hand. I just can't stop wondering, what are these creatures exactly? Where do they stop? What's at the bottom? Okay, this will be a fun one. William Wegman is an artist most notable for a series of photographs he produced starring his two dogs superimposed onto human bodies, which are just as oddly terrifying as that description sounds. Some of his most famous pieces include dog, dog on chair, and dog with dog. So naturally, the only way to make them even more horrifying was to give them a dedicated segment on Sesame Street where they move. Waiter, waiter. Waiter, I'm ready to order. One moment, sir. Waiter? At first glance, I think it's pretty amusing, but the more I watch it, the more strangely unnerved by these bipedal human-dog hybrids I become. Let me tell you about the specials. For entrees, we have peanut butter, hot dog, bologna. I'll have a turkey sandwich. If anything, I must admit I'm very impressed at how chill and polite these dogs are. Compliments of the chef. On the house. No charge. Those guys in the back are still waiting. The auto mechanic. Oh god, they have legs now. And no, we are not going to talk about the fact that there are also regular dogs in a world with human dog monsters. What is it? You need to replace this part. What? I'd like to highlight though that your viewing experience can be greatly enhanced just by making some minor additions to the audio. Okay, I kind of love this. Boo Bar is a show about a bunch of rotund alien looking things. I actually refuse to believe this was made by human beings. What you may be wondering is what they actually do all episode, and to be honest, even after watching nearly 20 minutes of a full clip, I still could not answer that question for you. I really really don't like these things. What I do know is that this was a premise they were somehow able to get 104 episodes out of. No one really knows where the boobars come from. They emerge from the sky at the beginning of every episode and by the end get sucked back into their cocoon, returning to the terrifying realm from whence they came. They're only in it for half the time though, as the midsections of the episode star their human captives, who don't utter a single word except of course for <laughs> And they all get up to some kind of monotonous activity that I am sure would be very enjoyable to a toddler with incomplete brain functions. No children, don't go toward the light! I'm really not sure what I'm watching right now, but I do know that I don't feel safe. And last but not least, we have the very short-lived Mr. Potato Head show. Yes, that was a thing. I think my favorite genre of kids programming are the ones where the people working on it know that the five-year-olds watching will have absolutely no idea what anyone is saying, and so they essentially just write whatever the hell they want. Hey, Agent Skulder from the X News, how do you answer the rumors that you have a secret plan to rule the world? How did you know that? The Mr. Potato Head show was surprisingly meta, as every episode is about him making an episode of TV, while of course still getting up to wacky antics in between. He's also a sentient walking potato whilst everyone else is a human, though on occasion he was accompanied by other talking food to make it less weird, I suppose. Okay, go away now. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, this thing got really strange. We must probe your brain now. I can take it. Yeah, but first, we're gonna make you listen to backpack music. What? Huh? I think quite possibly my favorite thing about this show is to go to this video compiling the whole series and skipping to random parts to see what weird shit I'd stumble across. Are you here to call us juddering magpies? I'm going to save you and the Earth from those goat-bellied alien loggerheads. Seriously, what the fuck? The Mr. Potato Head show was cancelled only 13 episodes into its run in 1998, probably because the network finally watched it and realized what they were actually airing. Cancel. 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 
The whole thing was actually considered entirely lost since its original run until 2016 when the episodes resurfaced online. And now we are thankfully able to witness the Mr. Potato Head show in all its glory. Get ready for the ultimate test of meat versus potato! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Yeah, you know, some things should just stay forgotten. I do very much appreciate the consistent running theme of Mr. Potato Head being a total dickhead though. Jack you! You, sir, are one of the fiendish alien overlords! I've been found out! Curse you, Mr. Potato Head! Wanted to give a very special thank you to this month's top Patreon supporters. Alex the Sandwich, Nebby, Primal, Enderpigman9, Rulu, Jake, Pro for Life9, Gulag, Pineapple Monster, Nightcore Gamer, and Sergio. And of course, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.